morning, Lakeside. How's everybody doing this morning? Thankful that there's not two feet of snow on the ground? Been a lot of times we've come here and there would be two feet of snow on the ground. Um, we got a couple of announcements and then we'll uh, go uh, to our prayer requests. Um, let's all remember uh, Carly. Uh, her address is out on the Welcome Center. As everybody knows, Carly is off to college. And I know we've done this a couple of times with some other of our, you know, young men and women that have gone off to college. Um, if you would, if everybody wouldn't mind, whoever feels it, you know, on their heart, just write that address down and just send her a card, a note, something. I'm sure she will much appreciate it, and I'm sure her family would much appreciate knowing that we're doing it for her. Um, she's just recently left, so um, let, let, let's all try and anybody that can do that. Um, also, home plate, uh, the Tigers game is coming up in May. I am going to organize a home plate trip this year, but I absolutely need to know next week who all wants to go. I have to get the tickets as soon as possible so that we can get good seats. I don't want to be up in nosebleed section. So uh, I've got a good relationship with the guy that does all the group tickets, and I can pretty much put us anywhere that we would like to be. So, But I need to know next week. So get the word out. Think about it. If you would want to go to the home plate uh, for the Detroit Tigers, um, uh, I need to know that next week. I'll have a sign-up sheet for that. Do you know the exact date of May? Of like I don't know. You'll have the info. May seventh. If anybody, if you just, if you just Google home plate 2016, it'll tell you the date. I know we're playing the Texas Rangers, I think. Um, but the the game starts at one, but we'll be at the park at like nine o'clock, nine thirty for a for an event, and we'll actually get to go out on the field for the home uh, home. They call it the home plate clinic. And you get to watch the Tiger players talk about fielding or hitting. It's a really good time for the kids to actually get to walk out on the field at Detroit at Comerica Park. It's pretty cool. Um, also, uh, God's Not Dead 2 is going to be coming out in May. Um, uh, our church is going. We're going to have the whole theater to ourselves. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do so. There's a sign-up sheet out there. And at this church on Wednesday before, I think that's uh, March 30th, the Wednesday before, um, the, the movie, we're going to be showing the first God's Not Dead here uh, on the big screen. So if you know anybody that would like to see that movie first before going to see the second one, um, we're going to have that here on Wednesday. Um, let's go to our prayer request real quick. Um, Jay wants us to remember her friend. She's got a close friend whose husband's biopsy results uh, from a there's a tumor in the stomach. So let's remember that. And then Jay also wants us to remember uh, a, a mom who had cancer has died uh, yesterday, so let's remember that family. Um, also, let's remember uh, the Wickenheiser family. Uh, they all got the flu. It just went through their whole family. And then uh, I just heard that uh, little Kaylee Smithers, uh, she's got it, and it's the same. looks like it's the same bug, so it's probably going to go through her whole family too. So let's remember those. Uh, let's remember our, uh, Pastor Tony as he comes uh, to, to break that bread of life. Let's remember each other. Uh, let's remember our nation, remember those that are fighting for our freedom. And I'm going to ask Brother Tom, if he would, to lead us. Oh, uh, announcement for senior breakfast, what time? Tuesday at 9 o'clock, senior breakfast here. Any other announcements? Tom, lead us in prayer, if you don't mind. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for everyone who is here. We pray, dear God, that they will leave this place knowing that they have been with Jesus and with your people. Lord, if there's any here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, we pray that something will be said or done that will cause them to want to be part of the family of God. Lord, we also remember the requests that were made just now. People have needs. Lord, help us to be sensitive to those around us. Help us to be prayerful and mindful always of the requests that are made in church. But then also help us to be careful and mindful of requests that we have outside of the church for prayer. Once again, ask your blessings on this service. Pray for Tony as he gives us the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Good morning. Good to see you in the Lord's house this morning. We thank you for coming and being with us. Guests and visitors, if we have any, we welcome you and thank you for coming this hour of worship. Marty Carly's off to college. Young man went to college, and about two months after he got there, he wrote his dad a letter, and he said, no mon, no fun, your son. Dad wrote back, too sad, too bad, your dad. <laughs> so uh, they were quite a poet, but uh, I know it's got to be hard. Uh, I never had the privilege of going to a, uh, away. I went to the University of Brenda, Brenda and... Uh, She's taught me about everything I know, but it's always good to be in the Lord's house. Good to see you. Good to see your smiling faces. And if you're a child of God, you've got a lot to rejoice about. We have problems the same as anybody else, but yet we have someone that we can always turn to to strengthen us and help us in every avenue of our lives. So we're thankful that if you're a child of God, you should rejoice this morning. And if you're not, you should want to be because there's nothing better than being a child of God. No matter what position that you may hold in society, that becoming a Christian is the greatest thing that can ever transpire in your life. Become a follower of Christ. Brother Larry's down in Florida. Uh, I think he texted Brenda yesterday. They had a good flight, but it was raining down there. And I went, ha, ha, ha. (laughs) No, he needs a good break. So, but... uh, We'll do the best that the Lord allows to it this morning. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn with us to Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 1. St. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, as we stand for the reading of God's Word. And again, he entered into Caperna after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was more of four. And when they came, could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoned in their hearts. Why doeth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy son's sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way unto thy house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it of this fashion. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the privilege that we have today to be gathered with your people. Father, I'm thankful for your precious word, and I pray, God, that you would bless the reading of it. And Father, as we look into it, we pray, Lord, that you just open up our understanding to where that we can truly apply it to our hearts in each and every day of our walk of life to where that we might be able to understand and to where not only understand, but we would put in that uh, actions into what you would instruct us and faith, help us to where that we'd never say anything within ourselves, but it'd come from your word and through the Holy Spirit. These favors we action your son. Amen. So we see this man that had an illness. If you remember back over in John chapter 3, Brother Larry touched on Nicodemus, preached on Nicodemus not too long ago. He came to Jesus by night. Then in the fourth chapter of John, there's a woman at the well, and he told his disciples as he was making his journey, he says, I have needs to go through Samaria. 
which was odd because Jews did not have much to do with the Samaritan. But Jesus said, I have needs. In other words, he wanted, he went to the woman at the well. Now then, in this chapter of Mark, we see four people bringing people to Christ. And so that uh, any way that you, uh, is possible, we still need to get people to come to Christ. Sometimes we may have to go by and get them. Sometimes we may have to make some sacrifices on or on. But if you have someone that you really uh, desire to come to know Christ, you should put every effort in trying to get them to where they can hear the word of God. Bringing others to Jesus. Jesus came to save sinners. He'd done many other things in his uh, ministry here in the, uh, uh, while he was here on earth that uh, we can see that he uh, brought sight back to the blind. He caused the lame to walk. He even had control over nature, the winds and the seas. He had all of that. But his primary reason was to come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to seek uh, to save sinners because that he is the only way that you and I, uh, human being, uh, mankind can be reconciled back into God as through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He realized that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so that this miracle demonstrates three things that I would like for you to think about. First of all, the authority, the power, and the responsibility. That we can see the authority of Jesus to forgive sins. What did he tell the lamb man? Thy sins be forgiven thee. And then what did he do? He had the authority to forgive sin. He had the power to heal the man. He said, pick up thy bed and go your way. And then the responsibility is where you and I come in. If it had not been for these four men that were concerned and burdened down for this man to get him to Jesus, that he would not have had the opportunity. And that's the reason why that it is so important for you and I to realize that when someone needs to come to church that we should make every effort that we possibly can to where that we might uh, bring them with us. The authority of Jesus Four burdened men, many things we do not know about them. See, it isn't important at who you are, but what you are. Uh, Who you are, if you're a child of God, that should be the most important thing. I'm thankful for the name that I have. Uh, I'm the product of Joe and Ada Massengill, and in the community that I lived in, uh, they had a pretty good name, and I'm appreciative of that. But see, I'd rather be known as a child of God as any other thing. I'd rather be known as a Christian as have any other title attached to my name. So their names was not important. Another thing we don't know, we don't know their age. We don't know whether they were young, old, or whatever the case may be. But as long as you're on this side of eternity, God's got something that he can use you for, something that you can do for the glory of God. And so that we can see, and we don't know what position in society they hold. God doesn't care what position you have, uh, that he wants you to uh, first accept him and put him first in your life. And with the, the position that you have in society, use it for the glory of God. Uh, some of you are teachers and have been very instrumental in leading some children to, uh, to Christ, and that's wonderful. Sometimes we have the privilege when we at work to share our testimony with those around us, and, uh, and we've led people to Christ, and that's wonderful. So we need to realize that as long as you're on this side of eternity, no matter the position that you have in society, that God can use you for his honor and glory. So that doesn't make how long, we don't know even know how how long they'd been followers of Christ, but we don't realize that somewhere along the way they had heard Jesus or uh, had heard about him enough to believe that, that if they got their buddy to Christ, that he could heal him, that he could help him in the infirmity that he had. And so that's very important for you and I to realize it doesn't matter what that person has done, no matter what has transpired in their life, that there's only one sin that is unforgivable and that is unbelief, that you deny their is a God. You deny there is a a Christ. You deny that there is a Holy Spirit. There's nothing that God can do for you because you've rejected the plan that he established before the foundation of the world uh, so that we need to realize many things. We uh, How long they've been followers, I I don't know. Uh, But we can see that uh, the woman at the well, immediately she went back into town and told him, come and see a man that told me all that I ever did. See, I don't think you ever get... Uh, seniority in church or in Christianity. You get respect but you do not get a seniority because we're all equal in the sight of God. Whether you've been saved 50 years or 5 minutes, it doesn't make any difference. God wants to use your life to where that you'll be useful and that he can bless you and you can receive the blessings of God and have some peace and satisfaction along the way.
and so that we can see uh, many things we don't know about them, their names or whatever. What do we know about them? They were concerned about their sick friend. Uh, they were uh, willing to put forth some effort. Not only were they concerned, I believe they were burdened down. I believe there's a difference be- between being concerned and having a burden. A burden is when you get up with it every morning and you lay down with it every night. Concerned, I have a concern for all mankind. I don't want anyone to go out of this world unprepared to be God. I have a concern, but I don't really have a desire for everybody. But there's a few people that I think about almost as soon as my eyes open of the morning and just before my eyes close at night because I have a real burden for those people that they will, they need to come to Christ and therefore uh, that I need to do everything that I can to where that they might have the opportunity that I would not hinder them in any way along the way. Uh, what do we know? They were concerned. They believe Christ could meet his need. The day that Christ can meet your need no matter how great or how big it is, it doesn't matter whether it's financially, physically, emotionally or whatever the case may be that he's a healer of all kind that he first of all uh, wants to heal that broken heart uh, that has been separated with, from his father because of sin he wants to reconcile you back into a relationship uh, to where that you're going to have that comfort in knowing that you're a child of God and so that we can see uh, that he's uh, wants to meet their deeds they were burdened enough to act Not only were they concerned, not only were they burdened, but they acted upon the situation. Sometimes that I have sympathy for a lot of people. Sometimes when we're watching TV and I show these pictures of these small children and some of the places that they are and how uh, they're living and it just breaks their heart because uh, of the condition that they're living in. And I, I think about my children or my grandchildren and it would break my heart to see them in that condition. But yet, uh, uh, do we act upon it? Yeah, we do because we as Baptists, we send missionaries not only to preach the gospel, but to tell them and help them in everyday walk of life. I was at a mission conference a number of years ago and we were building some reservoirs and some uh, 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 cistern type things that would contain water because I believe it was Ethiopia at that time. Uh, they, they had rain uh, about six months out of the year and another six months they had nothing. Somebody said, why are we spending all this money on building them reservoirs and, and building them uh, places to where they can store water to where they can have it the year round. And the missionary said, you can tell somebody about Jesus and that there's a God in heaven that loves them and they're sitting there and their bellies are growling and they're thirsty because they have no water. But he says, you first meet their f- uh, physical needs and they'll sit there and listen at you all day. Because that you've shown that it's just not word, lip, uh, words from the lip. It's a way that you have treated them and helped them. And they realize that uh, when they ask you, why do you do the, what you do? It's because of the love of Christ in our life. If, you wanna, if we want to reach people here at, at Lakeside, uh, if we want to reach out into those, do it because of the love of Christ in our life. If we go with any other motivation, it's the wrong motivation. We have to have the love of Christ. They were burdened enough to act. And then when believers don't care, the day that it seems like we've lost the urgency of the message. Brother, I can remember the old preachers would preach hell so hot you could feel the flame because they had uh, uh, urgency in their message. They realized that there was a hell out there that people without Christ was going out of this world and unprepared. That's where they ended up at. And he didn't want nobody to do that today that we think it's a scare tactic, but it's a fact of life. Without Christ, you go out of this world unprepared to meet God. And so that we say today many is going uh, unconcerned because uh, they, they think it's the pastor's job. I look at the early church over at Mar- in Acts 8 and 4. It said when this, they begin to scatter, it doesn't say it. It says they. It doesn't say uh, ministers. It don't say deacons. It don't say anything. It says when they were scattered, they went preaching the gospel. And you can see the results of the early church because everybody was, had one 
one thing upon their mind, and that was to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those around them. And so they, they uh, know not so in the early church today that we need to realize that early church is the model that you and I should be uh, put uh, as our example and to where that we might modern uh, pattern ourselves after it hit. All believers are ministers. You may not have a title uh, that, uh, that uh, of reverence or, or pastor or, or whatever the case may be. You may not be a deacon and have that title. You may not even be a, a Sunday school teacher and you may not have that title. But brother, if God has saved your soul through his son Jesus Christ, you've got a testimony that you can tell somebody. The disciples said, the only thing I can tell you is what I've heard and what I know, what I've seen. And to where that's all that God wants us to to do is to tell others what he's done for us. You don't have to preach the Bible. You don't have to preach a big message with, oh, with a lot of verses, but just tell them that you were lost and Christ came into your heart and your life and you became a child of God and it changed your directions. It was just not a ritual, but it was a true transformation on the inside that it saw, caused you to realize as you begin to look at things differently than you had before. You begin to love the things that you used to hate and hate the things that you used to love because that you realize that they were contrary to what God wants out of your life. And so that we can see these men got there and there was a crowd there. Brother, any time that you get on fire for the Lord, there'll be an obstacle come along the way. When you start bringing people to Christ, he'll put up every roadblock that he can find and try to prevent you from it. But this man, uh, the press was so great, I think that he couldn't even get probably close to the building. But brother, they, I looked up. Brother, if you want to find answers to your problem, look up. The psalmist said, I'll look into the hills from which my help cometh, not with her behind. I know when I pray, I close my eyes and I bow my head. But brother, I'm praying to a God which is in heaven, high and above this world that we know of, and he's still on the throne and he's still in charge. And I'm thankful for that. The house was crowded to get in. How many obstacles when we bring people to Christ? But they overcame the obstacle. They looked and, uh, upward and they saw, hey, this place has got a flat, a flat roof. Most of the buildings at that time had a flat roof. And they usually had a stairway on the outside to get up to that roof. Uh, so they said, ha ha, we'll get up, go up to the roof. Maybe we can get in that way. A lot of them submit sometimes that according to history, some of them had a trap door that they'd have up there. And in uh, and, and the heat of the day, uh, of the night, they would go up there because maybe a little breeze would be blowing. But they went up there. And they didn't know what they would find when they got there. But they decided to do something. Sometimes that you don't know what the end results is doing is going to be. But you need to just follow and be obedient as God directs your heart. And they went up and uh, they found the solution. And so they began to, uh, the roof provided a route to Jesus. Uh, this may be costly. This man, uh, he, his house. I never see anywhere where he complained about them tearing up his roof. I'm sure they might have repaired it, replaced it. But brother, uh, any time, it, it cost us something. It'll take some sacrifice on my part and your part to get people to come to know Christ. It'll take some ability. I will have to put some, th some things aside that we uh, might want to do uh, and to try to be helpful to someone. The roof provided a route to get to Jesus. Uh, it may be cost. It must be broken up. Today, my friend, uh, that there, uh, things have to be broken before they can be made whole. The Bible tells me that you have to come to Jesus with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I believe that roof represents that man's heart, that he was broken on the inside because of the condition that he was in. And he realized that he was in need of help because there was nothing that he could do for himself. And so that he said, when Jesus saw their faith, four had faith going those four men, I can just imagine them. One on each side of the bed, lifted him up now on the count of three. Let's get in unison to where we don't get him off. I'd throw him off the bed. I believe when they got down there and on the count of three, I believe they began to take him out to where that they could find some relief. And brother, uh, they were willing uh, because of their faith. Four had faith when they got there. 
five went away, and we know of it had faith when they left because not only did the four have faith in Christ that he could help, but that fifth man, uh, Jesus said, thy sins are forgiven. Pick up thy bed and walk. In other words, he was saved by the grace of God. He was healed by the power of Jesus Christ. And brother, don't you think he went away rejoicing? Didn't you rejoice when you became a child of God? I was uh, just a little nine-year-old boy, and I was as healthy as a horse as far as I know. But brother, I tell you, when I got saved, Something transpired in my life, and I've never been the same since. But when they saw him, five went away. Son, thy son, sins be forgiven. First things first. See, he took care of the spiritual before he did the natural. He took care and said, thy sins be forgiven you. He could have healed a man, and he would have still had to die at some place. And without Christ, he would have went out unprepared. But the first thing he said, thy sins are forgiven. And then the healing process started. Brother, if you want to get saved by the grace of God, it'll take some healing along the way. And I believe that these men, the authority of Jesus is to forgive sin. And you always have critics. The scribes were sitting there. They were just waiting for him to make a mistake. They were just waiting to, to, to uh, uh, causing problems and cause people to doubt who he was or what he was. And they begin to con be concerned that this man has blasphemy. He thinks he is God. And he says, I am the son of man. And so that we can see that he was all God and all man. And he had the power to forgive sin. He had the power to heal. And I'm thankful today that take up thy bed and go thy way to thy own house. I'm thankful that uh, when I got saved by the grace of God, I wanted to go to my house. I wanted to go to church where my house was. That had been established. And that's the house that I wanted to go to, to where that I could be together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Rejoicing over conversion and healing of the lame man. Can you imagine, as I catch my breath for just a minute, when you're sick, you'll just about do anything. Last year when I was having some complications, I don't know where Brenda Hurt got this from, but she says, honey, you need to take two tablespoons of honey, two tablespoons of lemon juice, and two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. And put it in a little water and drink it. It's supposed to be good for your bladder and those type of things. It, it was awful. That you can't, God, I believe you could put five pounds of sugar and two tablespoons of vinegar and you can still taste the vinegar. But you know what? I was willing to try it because I didn't want to be in the state that I was in. I wanted to get better. I wanted to be to where that my body would function again. And she said, she didn't tell me this until after I'd taken it the first time. You got to do that three times a day. <laughs> oh, my mom used to give us castor oil. Can anybody remember castor oil? It looked like white syrup. I cannot stand white syrup on pancakes to this day. It puts me to mind the castor oil syrup. But anyway, my mom would put it in a glass of orange juice. And give it to him. I said, Mom, I don't want it that way. Just let me have it and then give me the orange juice. You're just messing up my orange juice when you put that, that stuff in it. But my point is that you, when you're sick, when you're hurting, you'll just about do anything to try to get out of that state. And people don't want to come to Christ. And I tell you what, nothing has ever been as bitter as that apple cider vinegar that I've done for the Lord. Nothing. To, I, I, I've, I've never, uh, I've always enjoyed it. I may not have wanted to when I got into it, uh, before I started it. It's like preaching. You dread getting up to preach so bad. But once you get into it, boy, you feel good. So, you know, let me say this. We want to come to a close. Heaven rejoiced because the man became Christian. The Bible teaches us that there's rejoicing in heaven when one repenteth. And so that we can see that heaven rejoiced. And they rejoiced 
because they had just a little bit to do with it. They had just acted upon what they thought they could do to help this man. And this morning, as we get us a song, Tom, as we come uh, to give you an invitation, did somebody bring you here this morning? Did you come on your own? Or do you just realize that Jesus is passing by as the woman at the well did? See, the means that you got here ain't real important. The important thing is that if you're here, and regardless of what I've said, the reading of God's word is the most important thing because that'll bring conviction when nothing else will. And this morning, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, let me encourage you. There's nothing else in this world that you could do any better or any grander than to give your heart to the Lord. I've heard a lot of people say, I regret not becoming a Christian until my latter years, when they were 40, 50, 60 years old. But I've yet hear one say, I regret being a child of God. I, 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 I regret becoming, I'm being saved by His grace. I wish I'd have done it a whole lot sooner because I wasted a lot of time. But see, that's behind you. See, with the devil, you've got a past. He's always trying to bring up something in the past. And God is always giving you a future. He's always leading you and guiding you in a path to where there's a future to it. This morning, if you're here without Christ, you examine your own heart and your own uh, self and see where you stand at with God as we stand for a verse of the song. voice just speaking to your heart in a still small way that you realize that it's God speaking to you because he speaks as no other does he speaks with authority he speaks with uh, compassion he talk, speaks with love because that's what he wants to do in your life he hung on Calvary because of the love that he had for mankind second verse is going to be a little bit different. This man would have never got to Christ if four hadn't cared about him. Maybe you need someone to help you. That you feel that you could, you want them to come with you for prayer. But to be that person that you can depend on. So many times that we think when we come down there that we're all by ourselves. Maybe there's a person here in this a sanctuary that you left to have them pray with you. And if it is, this next invitation, just give them by the hand and ask them if they'll come and pray with you. I promise you beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to pray with anyone for any need that they have in this walk of life. One more stanza.
praying with her. Here's another one that's come that's just lost her husband that in need of prayer. See, there's many needs in this walk of life. And you know what the good thing about it? God has entrusted you and I with the message that will help everyone that, has, that will bring comfort in each and every heart that we have the privilege of praying with. Those that are looking to Him this hour. them if they would like to say anything. They don't have to. We'd never embarrass anyone. We'd never say anything that would cause you to pick you out or whatever. But if you have, if you feel like that, we want to give you that opportunity. I know Fran has came and she's lost her husband and a big change in her life. I asked my grandmother one time, she lost children and grandchildren. And I said, Granny, when, what's the most important thing? She said, when you lose your spouse, you lose half your life. And she said, I had the kids, I loved them, the grandkids. But said, that was my life when your grandfather died. So it's hard for us to imagine what Fran may be going through. But I'm thankful that she's willing to come. She knows what, where the answer is and the help is in her life. Any words? David. We got business meeting, a uh, special call business meeting later, but all that would is come in and shake hands with the young lady that comes forth. I don't know what the situation is, and that's not important for me. Uh, just that she's satisfied with what transpired. She's willing. 